sure you get your footage tomorrow or tomorrow morning. Stage. In just a few moments, Golden Umbrella Award and the Poet Populist finalist will be taking the stage. In the meantime, FYE for your entertainment, the official CD retailer of Bumper Shoot is here and has CDs by your favorite Bumper Shoot artists. Also, Bumper Shoot would like to express our appreciation to our incredible staff of 500 volunteers. Without them, Bumper Shoot wouldn't be possible. Thank you so much. So let's thank our stage sponsors, KUOW 94.9, Seattle Metropolitan, and Seattle Center, Bumper Shoot's venue for more than 37 years. And now, please welcome the Golden Umbrella Award and Poet Populist finalists. Hi, thank you so much for joining us at the Literary Arts Stage at Bumbershoot. We're really happy to have you here today. Today we're going to be starting off the Literary Stage with a two-part program having to do with poetry and community. The first part of our program is going to be the presentation of the Golden Umbrella Award. The Golden Umbrella Award is Bumbershoot's Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts. And this will be the 10th occasion of this award being presented. So it's not an annual award, and today is the 10th occasion of the award. Here to present the award is Louise Delange. She is a co-founder of One Reel. She's got some great stories about the original days of Bumbershoot that she was delighting us with backstage. And she's also the organization's Countessa Deluxe. Additionally, she is a longtime friend and collaborator of this year's recipient. Please welcome to the stage, Louise Delange. Hello, and thank you for coming inside on this fine Sunday morning. I could spend a lot of time talking about Judith Roche, since I know her better than many, many other people. Um, but I won't. But I will uh, give you all the good inside scoop. Uh, Judith was uh, grew up on the gritty streets of Detroit. She was the daughter of two labor activists. She started her nearly adult life as a pregnant, married teenager, in that order. <laughs> she, she passed through rocky years, raising two children with all the love that she embodies, and moved on to become a serious overachiever. She managed to earn several degrees in her spare time, she became a high school English teacher, a middle school teacher, a college teacher, and a teacher of incarcerated children and adults. In her some years of existence, <laughs> Judith has performed residencies through the Seattle Arts and Lecture Wits Program, the Washington State Artist in Residence Program, teacher training for Tacoma teachers, University of Washington Extension Program, City University, and Antioch, Seattle. She has graced the stage at more than 100 conferences and literary presentations, and waxed poetic at over 200 readings and performances. Ms. Roche has accumulated 13 awards and grants, not counting today. She's created public artwork <coughs> with a variety of artists from various mediums, and has written for more literary publications than we have time to detail today. For the Riemann Hall Incarcerated Women's Project, she, cur excuse me, she curated and edited The Bottom of Heaven, a collection of artwork and poetry in 2003, followed by the direction, scripting, and editing of A Girl Who Lived in a Shoe, a video in 2005. Using the other side of her brain, Judith researched, selected, and wrote copy for the literary po portion of Microsoft's CD-ROM encyclopedia, Encarta. Ms. Roche's published works include Ghost, Empty Bowl Press, 1984, Myrrh, My Life as a Screamer, Black Heron Press, 1994, Salmon Sweet, a cycle of poems about salmon, installed in audio and poster form at the Hiram M. Chittenden Locks in 2001, and her latest piece, Wisdom of the Body, 2007, Black Heron Press. 
and these were her part-time gigs. <laughs> and in and around all of those accomplishments, Judith and I bumped into each other, and I hired her for a single summer's work here at the festival, and she never left. Judith breathed, breathed life back into the Bumper Shoot Literary Program starting in the early 80s. She traversed two decades, which is 20 years, as Bumper Shoot Literary Director. From 1986 through 1994, she edited Ergo, the Bumper Shoot Literary Magazine. Outside of the festival, the literary partnership hit the road. In 1993, yo words, a four-year creative writing program supported by One Reel and the Seattle Public Schools shook things up, bringing street-savvy, nationally recognized adult writers face-to-face -face with a tough audience of bored, uninspired teens. The project culminated in two workbooks and an annual publication of student writing. From 1999 through 2001, I Am Salmon, a One Reel education project funded by the Bullock Foundation and philanthropist Allison McGregor, united children from around the North Pacific Rim, focusing on salmon, environmental education, and the shared indigenous cultures of Japan, Russia, Canada, Alaska, Washington, and Oregon. Meanwhile, in a parallel reality, Judith and I co-edited First Fish, First People, a collection of works by native writers from around the Pacific, illustrated with photographs by Spike Mafford. Judith and I have been through a lot together, at work and at play. I nearly electrocuted her with a poorly grounded espresso cart at my 40th birthday. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't kill her, and in fact, it seemed to invigorate her further. <laughs> Today, I have the privilege of presenting the Bumper Shoot Golden Umbrella Award to a dear friend as she joins the ranks of other notables, such as visual artist George Sudakawa, Guy Anderson, Jacob Lawrence and Gwendolyn Knight, director Dan Sullivan, writers Tom Robbins and Ursula Le Guin, choreographer Pat Graney, historian Paul Dorpat, and jazz vocalist Ernestine Anderson. And now I give you poet Judith Roche. We'd like to first present you with an autographed fine arts poster by Don Cerny, this year's artist. And also, one moment please, while I tell you what this fabulous is <laughs> for you. I will take off the lid. Okay. This is an objet d'art, origami <laughs> folded book by Curtis Steiner. Oh. And it is created from the Collected Letters of Alexander Pope, and it was printed in 1894, which means that it is your, your my age put together, the same <laughs> age <laughs> we are collectively. So this is for you. And I will, yes, it's a beautiful piece. Oh, and you can, yeah, you, can, you can put it on your mantle, and then you can take it down and read his personal diary whenever you feel like <laughs> catching up on that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I am overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed, really. <laughs> ah. Well, to quote another departed poet, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> oh, 
who knew when I started working at One Reel about 20 years ago that Louise Lovely, my smart, funny, sexy boss, might someday be introducing me this way. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Neither of us would have guessed that. Who knew that Bob, my intern of about 10 years ago, would be my successor in my one real job and direct the literary arts program and much more and take it to a, the next level. And thank you, Bob, for keeping literary arts strong at Bumbershoot. <laughs> and thank you, Sheila and Michelle, for making that possible, too, and for being friends. <laughs> Who knew I'd be there 20 years? <clears throat> what was my day job turned into a passion and a mission for art, culture, and poetry. And I learned from Louise and One Real that you can bring your whole self to the workplace and have fun doing it. In fact, One Real's philosophy is to bring the best art to the Northwest and have fun doing it. One Real's motto is, ha, ha, ha. How cool is that to work for a company whose motto is ha, ha, ha. Thank you, Norman Langell, El Presidente. I wear my one real jacket, which says ha, ha, ha. And people say, why does your jacket say ha, ha, ha? It's lovely. <laughs> Who knew that Ron Real's Salmon Project, the brainchild of Louise and Jane Cordry Langell, and thank you, Jane. Um, which I was privileged to have a major role in, would make writing about our Northwest Pacific salmon a major part of my life's work. First fish, first people let me swim in deeper waters, and I took off from there and have been really writing about salmon since. Life works in mysterious ways. So I deeply and humbly thank my sisters and brothers at One Reel for giving me the Golden Umbrella Award, and I'm just still floored. <laughs> and I am grateful for all the poets, artists, arts administrators, arts programmers, arts educators, all involved in the act and the business of bringing art to our world. Bless you for keeping the world more artful and reminding us of our own humanity. It is truly the work of the angels, truly soul-making work, which I undertook humbly and gratefully. Faulkner says, an artist is a creature driven by demons. He doesn't know why they choose him and is generally too busy to wonder why. And knowing what I know now, I would add arts producers as well to that. The great poet Czesław Milos says, Poetry is the passionate pursuit of the real. And it is the real for those of us called to do it because it's the only thing that includes everything, all, all the feelings, all the nuances within. Besides my children, I, I have dedicated my life to making, promoting, and teaching poetry. The successful poem, not that they all are, can say much more than can any other way of saying whatever it is. It's complete in itself, and it touches the whole complex of feelings for which there are no words. And in fact, that is the project of the poem, to say with words what cannot be said in words. It's doing the impossible by definition, but doing it. Not that we can do it at will, but if we're really good at studying, reading, respecting the muse, and hold your mouth just right, sometimes it happens. But you can't will yourself to do it. You just have to study, work, and then it's a gift when it happens. It takes a lifetime of work. There's another quote, but I've lost the so source. If the muse is late for work, Start without her. <laughs> and I thank Jerry Gold, my publisher, for letting my poems see the light of day and go out in the world. Why we do this is another story. 
we who have no choice but to try to understand the world by writing poems. No money, little reward in it, though this is a good, great reward. But I know in my heart and my core that it's soul making and it saves lives. Which brings me to another part of what I do. I know art saves lives from my own life and from teaching in prisons with people for whom there is no out. Some will live their lives there, but some of those, not all, but some of those take on the project of writing the poem as a redemption, as a way of understanding their lives and of growing their souls. Passing poetry on this way has been part of my mission in the world. Art saves lives. Finally, I want to say to the young people in the audience, including my beloved grandchildren and the friends they've brought, find your own passion and mission for your own precious and wild life and follow it and have fun doing it. I'll conclude by reading three poems. The first is a new poem and a historical sketch from my childhood. It's a true story. Its title is Hoffa, a story for the benefit of the youth in the audience who will not know the name James Hoffa. Hoffa was a very public figure who was accused of a lot of murders and was later murdered himself, though the body was never found. But the poem is not about him, but about his son with whom I went to school. Hoffa, a story. I remember the substitute in history coming to the boy's name, an unhealthy gleam of almost purient curiosity. Hoffa, she pounced, are you his son? Aloud and loud, every child and teacher in Cooley High School knew this boy was the son of the famous name that shrilled in bold 130-point type in our nightly newspapers. Miss K of the Polish name with many consonants, our real teacher, would not have made the boy talk about it. We were in the 11th grade. What did we know about adults intrusive probing in an open wound? We were only beginning to learn of adult agendas. We were not quite blanks, but still growing the faces we would become. The boy just said yes. The kids leaned in around him, held their collective breath, embarrassed for the boy. Well, what does your father think about the newspapers, she pressed, an itching in her voice, and is he guilty? We were in the 11th grade for such a short time. We're just learning the meaning of the word grace. We were beginning to grow language and abstraction like chin hairs and new breasts, though most of us could not have used grace in connection with a kid in our class. But the boy found it in his answer. He said it was not part of history yet, so beyond the realm of class. I told the story at home. My father just rattled his newspaper. I don't believe what they say, my mother finally said. They've been through his life with a fine tooth comb and can find no murder to pin on him, nothing to prove. When that father did go to prison, it was only for tax evasion. My mother would still say they could prove nothing worse. And my mother continued, he's never been unfaithful to Josephine, the wife. My mother would care about that. That ought to count for something. It was Detroit. Snow fell, winter ice ringed, bare tree branches. Political dynasties rose and fell. Labor unions gained strength and lost it. In the looped back tangle of what was, history is the water we drink from the shallow footsteps of memory. We were nobody. We were kids. Our parents did things about injustice, or didn't. But either way, we believed them. Truth is lost, but story prevails. Years later, in Alaska, where we got few newspapers, we got the one that said that father had disappeared presumed murdered. I closed my eyes, aware of grief. My high school friend 
his sister a year above me in school, and Josephine. The story goes on as they all do for those left. For years, the father's disappearance became a national joke on talk shows and comics routines, and still is. Cement shoe jokes, common in Detroit, New York, Chicago, funny to some. I've seen the son on national television over the years, James, the son, graying as I am, looking more and more like Jimmy, the father, the face of the boy in the man. The son has taken the position of the father, but still with a natural grace, wearing the dignity he first found in the 11th grade. Um, I'm going to read The Angels, which is an old poem, so many of you have heard it. The angels are not like the saints. They do not discriminate but come to everyone. Their eyes burn green fire, but their kisses are icy. They can play rough when we get caught in the heavy crosswinds that swirl about their wings. They are not above artifice and sometimes appear in disguise a mask of smeared lipstick, gypsy bangles, or an old man's coat. Now and again, they carelessly give us gifts, an unexpected hobby horse, a day's free babysitting, a poke in the eye with a stick, or sudden slant of light on water. And we are grateful once we figure out how to move within their state of complex blessings. They work within great wheels and circles, turning light to dark and back again. They do not obey the laws of gravity, but laugh a lot and arise at will to hover like vast hummingbirds when we require attention. What they want of us is the mysterious secret we unravel and reweave down to dark and back again. And I'll end with this one. Um, I was asked to write a credo for a class I took. So, of course, it turned into a poem. Credo. I believe in the cave paintings at Lascaux, the beauty of the clavicle, the journey of the salmon. I believe in all the gods. I just don't like some of them. I believe the war is always against the imagination, is recurring, repetitive, and relentless. I believe in fairies, elves, angels, and bodhisattvas, Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. I believe Raven invented the earth, and so did Coyote. In archaeology lie the clues. The threshold is numinous, and the way in is the way out. I believe in alphabets all of them, and the stories seeping from between their letters. I believe in dance as prayer, and that the heartbeat invented rhythm and chant. Or is it the other way around? I believe in the wisdom of the body. I believe that art saves lives, and love makes it worth living them, and that could be the other way around, too. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us for the Golden Umbrella Award, and congratulations again to Judith Roach. I know it's been a pleasure for me working with her at Bumbershoot for some years now. Um, Judith is going to be signing copies of her book, Wisdom of the Body, and perhaps some of her other books after this program today, and she'll be outside at the University Books booth, which is right outside of this building. So I hope that you'll go meet Judith and take home some of her poetry with you. We're going to move right into the second half of our program today, so you're welcome to stay with us for the presentation of the award for the 2007 Poet Populist. I hope that you all got your votes in already, because the voting is closed, and we'll be announcing the winner today. 
Um, so to, uh, to tell you more about the Poet Populist program, I'm going to bring out Nick Licata. Nick Licata is a three-term city council member. He is the president of the council, and he's also a longtime champion of the arts, poetry in particular. And you can imagine why if you know, to, if you know that in addition to his public work, he is also a published author. Please welcome to the stage Nick Licata. Thank you, Karen. And uh, you know, before I say a few words about the poet populist, I also want to add my words of congratulations to uh, Judith Roach. She has been a real uh, asset to the city, uh, not only as the literary director for Bumper Shoot, but also as a, a very well-known and respected public artist, a teacher, and a mentor to many, many writers and writers, including myself. So I very much am happy that she won the Golden Girl Award. Um, poet Populist, it's, uh, and I should know this, I don't, but it's about five or six years we've been into it now. We've had a number of Poet Populists, and we're pro well, we were for a while the only city in the United States with a Poet Populist. Some other cities, um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Reno, Nevada, are also looking at um, starting up a similar program. And the basic idea behind a poet populist is that unlike a poet laureate who generally is chosen by the executive of whatever we're talking about, either the nation or the state, the poet populist is someone who the people of, in this case, Seattle, um, vote for. And uh, this past year, in fact, we had, I think, over twice as many people vote uh, to be submitted. Um, you have to have your name uh, presented by either a literary organization um, or a publisher. Um, and uh, we had a number of people submitted in their names. I think this, this year there was well over a dozen. Um, and uh, to, today what you'll hear are the four finalists. They'll each be reading their poetry and at the end of their pre presentation, uh, I'll come back out and I will announce the, uh, the winner. And uh, I uh, invite you to uh, enjoy the poetry you're about to hear and uh, uh, tell your friends about the poet populist because that person then for the next year will be uh, not just reading uh, poetry with that title, but we actually um, put aside time at the public libraries, who's one of the co-sponsors as well as One Rail. And uh, they also read poetry at special events for the city as well as some um, nonprofit organizations when they open up uh, new housing, for instance, for low income or various other kinds of activities, and they invite the poet populace to come. So what we're trying to do is integrate the literary arts with our civic life in a way that complements each other. So that being said, I am um, sad to announce that our current po poet populist, um, Jordan Imani Keith, became ill this morning. So she was going to be here today, and she's been a great poet populist. She's been out there in a lot of different venues. And uh, it breaks my heart, and I'm sure hers as well, that she was sick today. So I want to thank, actually, our MC who you just heard, uh, Karen Finney Frock, who in the past has been running the Seattle uh, Poetry Slam for a number of years. She's going to come back. There you go. She's going to come back on stage and uh, read some poetry. And then she will introduce alphabetically the four finalists and give a short bio on each of them. So let's give a warm welcome to Karen back to the stage. Well, it was such a nice, uh, such a nice honor to be asked to read today, um, and a last minute one. So I've thrown together a few poems to read. This one is called Lament for Pluto. And what do we do now when we feel so phony helping our children with their astronomy homework, naming with lazy tongues the eight real ones through mealy mouths that don't believe themselves, knowing in our hearts there are nine and wondering what else can be taken from us by science? 
Planet or not, this is the story for the youngest kid, for the last kid picked for the team, for the date, for adoption, for the kids who couldn't remember the names of anything unless Disney made cartoons about it, for the little guy, the planet of losers, always taking sand in the eyes from the foot of Jupiter, planet for the marking of distances, most likely to break off when somebody knocks the solar system model off the science table, second only to Uranus in jokes made. <laughs> Rock planet. Sad, quiet little planet with no playmates. Planet of the underdog. Planet of the oppressed. Planet for the hard of hearing. Can you hear them out there, Pluto? They just decided you are nothing but a rock a collection of dust into orbit, walking head down and moody through a sky that still belongs to us. Perhaps when we have finally finished turning our own dear sea blue baby, green dish rag of a planet into an ashtray, we'll turn our eyes up again, Pluto, crane our necks, Wonder if the sun will ever come close enough to lick you until you are pink and raw like a puppy, to blow on your skin until you giggle and purr, until you soften into a chocolate planet, a liquid planet, a wheat planet. And maybe, Pluto, you will forgive us for the way we keep thinking it within our providence to name you, and we can all start over again. This is called Hanford. I haven't always been a good employee, so I know. Skipped days, spent email hourings, even skimmed money at a latte shop so I can understand. Maybe the job was just too hard. Maybe the technology was slipping past you like a convoy through the desert, but you must have known the tanks were leaking, that radioactive earthworms were ant tunneling a course underground to the Columbia. When the world's first nuclear reactor rose full scale from the tumbleweeds of eastern Washington, it was to the people like an angry god summoned up to protect them. It shone yellow-green in the Richland night. It called for defense-minded scientists. I haven't always owned up. I hate to say it, I can relate. Those nights you lay awake beside your wife trying to remember what was bothering you again. The kids' grades and your hair turning gradually to gray like oxidation on metal barrels. There were the Nazis to consider and the Japanese with their paper balloons, so maybe that's why you made enough plutonium to turn Asia into a play of shadow puppets. We dropped a baseball on Nagasaki. You made five gallon drums full, and the waste was buried gallon by gallon into the river, while the truth chewed holes in the lining of your stomach, showed up brown and gray on your wife's cheekbone. You finally quit after you found yourself squeezing the baby to your chest almost blue. We know you knew. We've got records to prove it, a super fun site to point to, a line item on the budget the size of Hiroshima, trenches full of spent reactor fuel hidden under a rug of sand, it's all out now. I haven't always spoken up. When the shop manager poured bleach down the utility sink, I mopped the floors and took my tips home. But you must have wondered, when the green run spat iodine on the downwinders, you must have considered the devastation of a lit match of an earthquake. They lost track of where you moved to after. I'm betting it was somewhere upriver. I'm betting you sit in a chair most nights, clutching a pillow to your chest, listening as your children's thyroids grow in their necks and dreaming that you flew the plane.
And I'll read one more. This one is called Somewhere in the Atlantic. Accidentally saddling a storm somewhere in the Atlantic, the freighter tips and spills its top load cargo like a seasick stowaway, like a land-born gull, and vomits its shipment, 9,000 yellow rubber bathroom duckies overboard like a field of daffodils into the sea. Tested off the assembly line for buoyancy, the ducks swam V formation from the squall, a brave crew of survivors. It said they never looked back at the ship as it left them. She stands in the shower in lower Manhattan, rings her wash rag into the tub, maps the route to the airport with soap on tiles, saves enough money on the credit card for one flight to Paris, two hotel rooms, and one bottle of Chateauneuf de Pop. Years ago, fishermen off the coast of Canada reported discovering a field of hockey gloves bobbing 10 miles offshore, floating in groves like lily pads, a graveyard of games lost for want of outfitting. She stops the drain with her toe, then watches the whirlpool basin sink, Swears on the last bubble before the soap runs out. She'll move on when it's time. Jump ship when she's ready. Before it pulls her under again. This love like flotsam. This love like an iceberg submerged. Tonight, 1,000 pairs of Nike tennis shoes traverse the coast. They float. Laces splayed, bobbing heels to toes like a pirate fleet, like an armada. They go north, where they will finally beach, salty, waterlogged, and tired of running. Thank you. Well, now it is also my great honor to introduce to you the four finalists for the Poet Populist competition. We're going to bring them out in alphabetical order so that we're not giving any clues to who the winner might be. New York City-born Roberto Ascalon is a poet, writer, arts educator, and spoken word performance artist who lives in the historic Youngstown Cooper School in West Seattle. He connects his, with his audiences via universal narratives that encompass topics like racism, first kisses, love, family, and spam. Roberto currently works as a teaching artist and mentor for Youth Corps, Art Speak Seattle, and the Service Board. He was nominated today by the Youngstown Cultural Arts Center. Please welcome to the stage Roberto Ascalon. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. I'm going to try and breeze through two poems. The first one is about spam. Yeah. Not the email kind, but probably about spam. <clears throat> My father's love is a fried spam sandwich on Wonder Bread with extra mayo all wrapped up in aluminum foil. Spam is my father's version of Catholic communion. It's his way of saying, I love you, which he didn't say very often when I was growing up, but I ate a lot of Spam. <laughs> in church, you eat the body of Christ and receive holy life eternal, and with Spam, you eat pork that stays good in a can forever. <laughs> Sunday brunch at my house, garlic fried jasmine rice, laced with bright green scallions, eggs sunny side up with the edges brown to a fine crunch, and my favorite, golden brown leaves of thin sliced spam, fanned out like a deck of cards. That's a fact. Filipinos love to eat canned meat. It says to their neighbors, I'm rich, I can afford to buy meat. But I wasn't born in the Philippines. I grew up in New York City where nobody really ate spam. Spam was a joke back home. 
a sign, a tattoo, a tell, a mark. Spam is kitsch. It belongs in the secret stash of a 50s fallout shelter in between the iodine and the shotgun shells. But the truth is so much deeper, it's realer than real, because it's not food, it's irony. Spam is the first man, animal that man ever invented. It's what the people get after the livestock is slaughtered and all the able-bodied men killed. Spam goes great with a scorched earth policy. It's the meat that comes after the war. Maybe that's why Southerners love it so much. I can see my father's face since inhaling the sizzle hot, turning the crackling slices over, saying, you're gonna love this. And in high school, I zipped my knapsack tight so the other kids couldn't smell my house when I walked down the halls. I thought they might smell the hangdog look in my father's eyes, taste the history of yesterday's fly pan. Could we see spam is class in a can, the mark of the colonizer, a metal brand on the inside of my tongue. Spam is my father's heart, deep fried in bacon fat. Spam is the shame of animals not knowing the names of all their parts since the salt flesh of yesterday's American colonial expedition, surviving heat wave after heat wave in the equatorial pantries of my father's homeland. Spam is a brick of pink gold glistening in the merienda afternoon. Spam is the American flag come home to roost in my palate, take up residence in my arteries. The last hundred years of neo-colonial foreign policy fattening up their insurance premiums. Spam is the export product that Iraqi children will ask for by name. Spam, it's my fa father's fatty love. The rosy pink that says I care from the pigs of America's heartland. Real quick. This is written for Kevin and Renee. I wrote this for their wedding. They just got married. One is a teacher and the other one is a, um, an architect. Um, today is just another ordinary day. Today, there's one lone blackberry that's just decided to lose its petals somewhere. Somewhere. Continental divide is groaning under its own unknowable weight. <sighs> Did you feel that? Today, someone's ashes returns to the Ganges. Today, today. Tomorrow is coming, and I do not know much of it, except that it is coming. And I have no concept of time. You all know that. I shall always be late for tomorrow, but today you can trust me. I will be there for you today, on this day, under this tree, by this sun, on top of this good soil. Today you will depend on me. Today I will carry you on my back. This shot counts. This is the one. Today is today. This afternoon. This afternoon you will lay in my lap and sleep, and I will hold you. I will hold you where you are the softest. I will kiss you and you will taste like salty. And that is how I will love you today. Today we break, fall apart at the fault lines like ceramic dolls. Today we break, we break today. We fashion our sharp, our cut, our burst, our bark, our break. Design ourselves anew out of the mistakes. Build out of ourselves a city on the rubble. Remember me today. Make me another body. Remember my body. Remake my body. Remake me and map me. Remember me to the concrete. Name me the city. Bring the sidewalk to life and make it green, you life maker. Draw me the cartographer's en envy. Green, green, green. Plan me a life, you street runner. You lake swimmer. Run me down and catch me. Swim me. Swim the depths of me. Run me down when I am fast. When I am wearing winged sandals. Fashion me a quicksilver collar. Run as fast as you can. Keep up. You can do it. You can love me today. You can love me today. Quick. Quickly. Quickly. Now, now wait. Slow down. Because I'm tired. Today, let's lie down on the couch. Let's lie down on the couch and watch movies because sometimes there's no time for poetry and running about. 
There's only time for me to lie on your chest. There's only time for you to listen as I tell you about my day, for me to hear you tell me that I was wonderful today. Broken hearted and tight lipped in the pre dawn traffic. I'm waiting for God in the second cup at the coffee shop. Money blind in the grocery store. In the lacune. In the alveoli. The breathing place. I was wonderful there in that small place. I was wonderful and small and wonderful today. I was wonderful today. Today, which is, of course, the very smallest of all things. Today, we will make small ones, and there will be children, and you will be fat afterward. Don't worry about it. There will be children. I will fashion them from your shank bone, the long striding one, the marathon bone, and we will fashion them from my meats and spine, the delicate insides of your cells. We will collage them from articles, Harper's, and National Geographic's, and the black and white pictures of our families. We will build them out of Tagalog and Spanish and Portuguese, samba and salsa, and we will tattoo the name of every family member on their likenesses till they disappear under the weight of that ink, become black. Black, black, black like the inkwell black, moreno, pero moreno, and they will stain this world with the love of us, stain all the tomorrows and the pages of forever, will shiver and rustle with clean anticipation. Today, it'll happen today, because today is just another ordinary day. Today, the blackberries, they done lost their pet. And the continental divide is in, it's growing under its own umbrella for that one. Yeah, there you are. Today, someone's ashes returns to the Ganges. Today. 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 Roberto Ascon. The next poet we're going to bring out to read for you is Angela Martinez D. <laughs> Angela Martinez D is a poet, spoken word artist, and MC with the Sondheim Hall Arts Collective Roots. Performance poet since 14 and founding member, mentor, and educator for youth poetry organization Youth yes. Speak Seattle. Yes. <laughs> Angela became its program director in 2005. She has been integral in bringing young people's voices to the forefront of the poetry community in Seattle and nationwide. She teaches poetry and performance to youth and organizes an annual Youth Slam series, culminating in a team representing Seattle at the National Youth Poetry Festival. Please welcome to the stage Angela Martinez. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here with you all. I have a couple of poems to share with you. Um, but I wanted to start out with, with a quotation by um, an author that I totally respect and admire, um, Bell Hooks. This is a quotation, as I said. If I were really asked to define myself, I wouldn't start with race. I wouldn't start with blackness. I wouldn't start with gender. I wouldn't start with feminism. I would start with stripping down to what fundamentally informs my life, which is that I'm a seeker on the path. I think of feminism, and I think of anti-racist struggles as a part of it. But where I stand spiritually is steadfastly on a path about love. This poem is called Human Causes, and it's uh, otherwise known as the Greenpeace. In the 1970s, they dropped the news like bombs over Baghdad. Before too long, the earth will burn. Scientists were countered and silenced. The phrase global warming erased in official documents. Today, the earth suffocates in swirling clouds of carbon dioxide. The feeling's familiar. Asthmatic since the age of three, when I would choke on my own breath, mom would hook me to the ventilator. But there's no solution like that for our planet. No giant ventilator in the sky we can steal from its orbit. Nor can we stop the earth spinning long enough to place the mask over her gorgeous, cloud-covered face. A quarter of all children in Harlem have asthma. 
This is Homeland Security's most significant breach yet. Hurricane season are coming. Climatologists have made their findings, yet their hands are tied. The US never ratified Kyoto, and now that the protocol's passed outdated, the temperature is rising, and secondhand smoke will kill more than a million species in our ecosystem. We will be extinct. How much more serious must this get? And why are the deciders gone golfing? Question, what is the difference between effect and effect? Answer, the global poor, those whom warming oceans and changing winds will affect most, and those who have had the least effect on the current ecological situation. How can we undo this gunner's knot? Global warming tied to a global war both bred on their black gold and somebody's white ego, yet we still pump by the gallon with abandon, acting like there's a lot to waste. Environmental consciousness must be raised, so stop playing naive. Recycle like your life depends on it. Recycle because your life depends on it. If we promote only the use of renewable energy, force the automobile industry to cap its emissions and rethink its greed, the survival of the planet becomes a commercial priority for an uninhabitable world without people can buy and sell nothing. Some experts suggest more highway tolls. <laughs> but let's hit the American people where it will. Well, let's hit the American people where it will hurt the most. Ask Fox News to disable the use of MySpace. Cancel American Idol in every single NASCAR race until the CO2 emissions rate in this country drops 75% or more. The levels are rising every day. The tides are rising too. Melting ice sheets are predicted to increase sea level a half meter in this century alone. Coral reefs will be forced to give up the ghosts we both ride at the sea surface but the new depths may drown them with our hopes. If there is any chance of salvation to be had in legislation, let it not be our last resort. Yeah! Thank you. This is called Sama Vita Fall. When I teach, I am the wind. I know this. You cannot see the wind, but you'll always feel its presence. Whether a wisping of hair, kiss of air on your cheek, or one swift whistle by your ear, if you don't listen, you'll miss it. When I teach, I am the wind. My children, they be fireflies, afraid to shine their lights in the darkness of the ghetto for fear of being singled out. Semhar. Self-described, a short black building, a whale. Tony, a television set. Chucky, a gun. Reese, a charm bracelet made of gold, but in fact an iron lung Zemea, with a razor hidden under her tongue, flashes her smile at us, but once, then it's gone. She hides it quick, the dangerous weapon that it is. Rosemary, since her school days began, was bused from her home to Lower Queen Anne for her parents' hopes of a better education, one far from the Holly Park projects. Tamika, despite the gift of an innate stage presence, frets each day about her appearance, so she sees herself mostly as a child of God. My students, they be rocket launchers, government issue grenades, and pride their pins, exploding when pulled like Shai's hair and temper on her natural days. To Shakisha, everything come natural. Nicole, a small caged animal, double bent and hateful from years of being prodded at with roughened, two sharp sticks, her beat up running shoes pointed outward, toes already hanging over the precipice. My children been pushed to the edge and some of them prepare to slip into lives of labor after years of public education have prepared them for nothing but my kids then shut their eyes and ears to this learning business and learn to take matters into their own not quite growing hands. I let Chuck down the way a rock falls. Slumped down and unsatisfactory on his grade chart without warning in the way one chucks a rock across the water to watch it skip, but it may flop and let you down and up to an edge missing an intended leap. I let him down like a falling leaf, too bright from a heat they quickly come fall. From fall the new school year brings nothing for him. Cracking jokes about bricks of weed, I ask him for an image. He says, what? Bricks of weed and images? When I ask him for a simile, he writes, people twist like tornadoes. And even though I know he's right, he can't tell me why then when we cover metaphor, he writes, I am the sky, but with no faith in his words, never once have you had something in which to believe the worst mark I could give him was no fair warning. 
Unsatisfactory smacked him across the face like the cops did. The ones on his block accosting young men who look just like him. No fair warning. Come fall, the new school year brings nothing. No reason to trust his teachers. Why would I be any different? Ain't no one sparked a match under the pilot light of his conscious mind or blown him away with the power of words. And now it seems the only thing he's learned is not to care. Schools these days are teaching antiquated information, preparing students for a world that no longer exists. Schools these days are teaching antiquated information, preparing students for a world that no longer exists. End quote. My students, they're the dreams of maybe someday owning a black Range Rover or stories of pregnant teenage baby mamas, that's their friend with gangs and family drama, with big dogs on the block and sometimes suicides in the neighborhood or funerals on Saturdays, maybe midweek if the mortuaries all look like this, suicides in the neighborhood, or funerals on Saturdays, or maybe midweek if the mortuaries all look up. When I teach them, I'm the wind. They won't know I've been there till I'm gone and there is no more gentle pressure constant at their backs wishing waves into the sands of their youthful desert dreams. My students, they're the soft fleshy part on the inside of your cheek it's too easy to bite down on. But they're also the razor, glinting, solid, sharp, hidden under tongue pushed to the edge. Mind reeling at the precipice, see clammy palms, see seashells, the shadows of their future selves be all their shallow calls for help. Be but numbers to the school district, but butterflies to me. Be the iron lungs that live to let each other breathe. Be present moments. Be poetry. Floating like Chaitisha's hair on her natural. Thank you. If you um, appreciated the work, I have a book for sale. I also have CDs. Um, I'm going to close with one short one, inspired by a quotation by Sylvia Plath. <clears throat> she says, we stayed at home to write, to consolidate our outstretched selves. This is mine. In 1987, we would never have believed the world was so close to its end or that we'd be its radical axis. Our outstretched selves were not yet looming on the line of the horizon. If this is indeed our final chapter, I'm preparing for revision. Peace. That was Angela Dean. The next poet he's gonna read for us today is Richard Gold. Richard Gold founded and runs the Pongo Teen Writing Project a writing therapy nonprofit that serves homeless, incarcerated, and hospitalized youth. In his past, he developed a writing therapy program at an adolescent psychiatric clinic and earned an MA in poetry with a collection of poems about the youth and emotions at the clinic. The Odd Puppet Odyssey, a collection of Richard's own poetry with illustrations by Celeste Erickson was published by Black Heron Press in 2003 he was nominated to read today by, by Pongo Publishing Teen Writing Project. Please welcome to the stage, Richard Gold. It's a pleasure to be here and share some time with you all. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. I've been working with kids, uh, incarcerated and homeless youth for about 12 years now through Pongo and other time in site clinics. And I've learned so much. I, I feel like, I, I bet you, you understand, but I have a feeling many people might not, how much there is to learn from people who are in pain. The kids in juvenile detention the consistent theme in their work is early childhood abuse and neglect. And those words aren't even appropriate because there's a torturous nature to it that the, someone whose dad walks out on him not just walks out, 
but leaves behind the little presents that they made in kindergarten, leaves it behind. Or the girl who's being sexually abused, she watches her abuser get her mom drunk, knowing that's a prelude to the abuse. It's horrible. But on the other hand, there's this hopeful nature of poetry. We say to the kids right from the heart about who you are as a person. And they write about these, these experiences. This is the essential self that they're dealing with. And they're having breakthroughs in therapy. This is the feedback we get. So I'd say, think about what that means, that someone who is being listened, that you can listen to someone, that listening to someone can make such a huge difference in a person's life. Think about what that means in terms of community, our relationship to these kids in the community, how we can serve them, and what they have to share with us. So I'd like to read three poems by teens and one of my own right now. I have a table out there. We publish books of the kids' writing. Um, Pongo Publishing in the Alki Court. So stop by if you want to talk later. This is by a 13-year-old boy in juvenile detention. How tucked in the corner. You see that I'm alone. You see that I steal. But you don't know me. You would know me if you knew how hard it was to live alone. You knew how love has hurt me. You knew your mom didn't love you. You see that I smoke. You see that I fight. But you don't know me. You would know me if you knew how I turn emotions to haze. You knew how I don't fear death. You knew how tucked in the corner was sadness. Thank you. I, I, please applaud for this offer. This next poem is by a 14-year-old girl in juvenile detention. It's called Who Am I? When I was born, I thought I'd be an innocent child. But now I'm here in juvenile, like my mother, out running the streets, smoking crack and robbing people for money. And I thought, who am I? I lost my virginity to a guy I didn't know, hanging out with older people who wanted to get in my pants, thinking I could get in the game. And I thought, who am I? It's harsh out there. All you do is sit waiting for crack, spending your money on crack, being a crack whore. And I thought, who am I? People running in and out, worrying about cops, being thrown in the back of a police car and thinking, who am I? And now I sit in my room, thinking what to do with my life, be like my mother or be like myself. I'm ending up like her, but I'm different. I can change my ways, and I'm not like anybody else. And I thought to myself, that is who I am. <laughs> this poem is by a 14-year-old boy in juvenile detention. It's called Loveless. There are two parts to it. Loveless number two. Three words remain unheard. I love you. Emotions stay unstirred. I love you. Hopes shatter against white cell walls. Before I succumb to sleep, icy tears fall. Heart cracks and bleeds. I love you. Basic unmet needs. I love you. No trust anymore, yet I'm behind locked doors. Oh well, whatever. I love you no more. Loveless I may be. In here, more of my heart is confined than my body. People abandon me along my road to redemption. No one to lean on. My life proceeds without me, leaving me to catch up using collect calls. I'm so loveless here. Past mistakes reap their price from me with sighs of regret. Loveless I may be. But I love being loveless, not loving myself. I'll be out with the roll of the dice. Uh, 
Um, sometimes I'm sometimes I'm so serious about the work that you can imagine how how it impresses me. And I hope I I, I just will interject here a positive note. I hope in talking about how kids are being healed, I I gave that sufficient emphasis that the kids, people who are abused, the great majority of them are resilient. And some do have problems when they're children and teens, but they get through those problems. It's a minority that become the, the, they carry on the cycle of abuse. And in fact, the people who have been abused, who survived it, become some of our most moral and honest people. They have a higher priority on, on being honest about their feelings and doing what's right by their families and by other people, and I hope I, I, I'm glad I had this chance to make that point. And I'll end now with a poem of my own. It's called, You Are. You're at the beach on vacation taking a stroll, and the water is sparkling in the way it does, very green. And accompanying you on your walk rather unexpectedly is the shadow of yourself dancing. Maybe from the nightclub on this vacation or another, a happy shadow, considering it's yours. And with you also are other shadows lurking, the mechanic who overcharged you, your boss who critiqued your work unfairly, the lost shoe, the neighbor's dog. Then the dancing shadow comes up to you from behind and touches you lightly. Who are you now? You're a youth at the beach, and life is filled with hope and barely containable energy for a minute. As you think about putting your arm around the person lying next to you, though suddenly you think about the other people in that person's life, the competition for your future, the confusion every day when you step outside your parents' door. Then your companion touches you lightly. Who are you now? You're a baby, playing in the sand and splashing in the water, so light that if you could think beyond the moment, you'd worry that the salty breeze would pick you up and carry you into the sky, spinning. But inside you is already the kernel of a burden of your parents and their parents and those who came before, breaking people like breaking waves, beaten and beating, and the frustrations of your life that will take on greater and greater significance as if they will grind your bones and break your heart, leaving you deadened and alone, in ultimate loneliness. Then someone touches you lightly with the message that the pain you feel is not your fault. Who are you now? Thank you. Richard Gold. We have one more poet to read for you today. Cody Walker teaches English at the University of Washington and poetry through Seattle Arts and Lectures Writers in the Schools program. He also serves as a writer in residence at the Richard Hugo House. Cody received the 2003 James Boatwright Prize for Poetry from Shenandoah and the 2005 Distinguished Teaching Award from the UW English Department. His work appears on Buses and Bookmarks, as well as in Best American Poetry, Best New Poets, Parnassus, Slate, Prairie Schooner, Subtropics, and Light. He was nominated by Seattle Arts and Lectures. Please welcome to the stage Cody Walker. Well, I'm totally blind. Um, I want to echo some of the things that have already been said uh, today. Um, this is really a privilege and an honor and a pleasure. And I want to thank Nick and Frank and Bob for organizing this and all of you guys for showing up. So thanks a lot. This is called Stuck in the Middle. When I was born, my mother smashed a mirror. The mayor smashed a mirror in my honor. And Murray the metal maker, well, you can guess, hard pressed till I was one in 20. In four days, I'll be 40, halfway dead. 
Call Denny the ditch digger. Call my dad with mirror half hanging out of pocket. And call all living kin of Samuel Beckett. Senescence beckons. I'm kicking pricks. I'm aligning my sad self with the flocks of egrets that are tangled in my hair. Missing me one place? Stop. Search everywhere. I ask for nothing. Maybe a medal. Maybe a hand to pull me from the muddle. You're, um, you're not going to want to clap after every one of these because there are a bunch of them and they're very short and they may not even be good. So, um, <laughs> This is, I need a kidney and Dick Cheney's is a match. <laughs> Dear Dick Cheney, please give me a kidney. Then, when all the medical whatnot is settled, we should probably start calling each other bro. I could say, how's it hanging, bro? And you could answer, low to the ground, bro. Things like that. Also, is it true that you have a pet cougar? Because cougars are rad. Think about it. You, me, two kidneys, and a cougar. Looking forward to hearing from you, Cody Walker. Four poems. Iago is shoplifting at QFC. Some wax dental floss, a packet of fennel. Who will miss these things? Iago figuring out his deductions. My Rottweiler, he's like a child to me. Iago returning a Chumbawamba CD to Tower Records a week after purchasing it. This isn't the one I meant to buy. I didn't tape it. My tape player doesn't even work. <laughs> Iago sending personal mail by putting the intended recipient's name in the return address space and then not affixing a stamp, thus creating a return to sender postal situation. Really just as an experiment. <laughs> Costello, the Alzheimer's years. <laughs> Who's on first? My son? I have a son? <laughs> Blind date. I'm sorry, but I can't see you anymore. <laughs> Limerick. A new class of antidepressants is targeted at adolescence. They lose track of time, of meter, of rhyme. It's really sad. <laughs> I have a couple of poems for uh, folks who've left the stage, but they're here anyway today, I suppose. Earlier today, thinking the microphones were off, Secretary Rumsfeld yelled, kill, 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 kill. Jokingly, we think, but still. <laughs> American Idol. Alberto Gonzalez sang Texas Uber Alice while the founding fathers wept and the president slept. Here's one for somebody I hope doesn't leave the stage. Observation. Barack Obama doesn't need your drama. So she left you, kicked you in the cock. What's that to Barack? <laughs> Escalation, 2007. Georgie, Georgie, dressed in surge, waves his cape, two beasts emerge. One's called murder, one's called lies. They have a little baby, but the baby dies. Orgy, orgy, binge and purge. Gobble up the widows, the generals urge. Condi's on a talk show, Cheney's out to lunch. Bones are served au gratin, crunch, crunch, crunch. Um, sometimes I give my students the following assignment. Take a comic form, a limerick or a clairu or a double dactyl, and try to write a serious poem. Um, I, the tensions, I think, are interesting. So the next two, two poems come out of that idea, and the first one harkens back to the anthrax days. Snow nor rain. Higgledy piggledy, name not released as yet, handled the envelopes 20 odd years. 
Anthrax bacillus spores, pain on delivery, killed him on Saturday. Send him your tears. And I wrote that one back at the, at the time of 9-11, and then this one I wrote just a couple months ago. I'm not, I'm not really sure why it was on my mind, but it's called 2001 Through a Glass Darkly. Hastert was plastered, Cheney was lit, just give me a minute, I'll fall down. Bush with a book, it's best not to look, trade center, jets enter, I'll fall down. And I'm going to end with a poem called Danger Static. It's a double A to Sedarian, which means it runs A to Z down the uh, left hand side and Z to A down the right. And there are a couple of potential obscurities, I think, in this poem. Um, Deluded Tico Incorrendo is a writ inquiring into the you know, soundness of one's mind. And um, a cosmic year is the time that uh, it takes for the sun to orbit in galactic rotation about 225 million years. So, danger, static. Arsenic in a blintz, bats in a belfry, caveats in a billet doux. Do you ever wonder how early man existed without TV? Fuck you, grubby advertisement. <laughs> hey, Helena Bonham Carter, hold me in your arms. I have a crush on you, Helena Bonham Carter. <laughs> Jury duty in Iraq. KKK at the A&P, Loss, Delunitico Inquirendo. Meet me in Old Manhattan, near the abandoned oyster farm, or better, go to hell, purgatory, paradise, and be quick. Question, did Horndog LBJ really have oral satori sex in a hotel bathtub? Tongues are wagging. Ugh, oof, vaporize me, water lord. Xanadu in ruins. Cosmic year, complete, rub, dub, Zagreb, who cares, Yugoslavia. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Richard Hugo, Heather McHugh, James Lumps, or Kelly Ann McCarty. And whereas Seattle in 1999 was the first city in the nation to institute a program of choosing an official poet to a popular vote, with Cambridge, Massachusetts this year being the second American city to do so, and whereas Seattle literary organizations recently nominated 16 local poets as candidates for elections for the position of poet populist for the city of Seattle, with one candidate having received more votes than any other candidate. Now therefore, be it resolved by the city council that the winner of the 2007-2008 Seattle Poet Populist election, who as the official Seattle Poet Populist, will immediately begin representing and promoting the principles of populist poetic expression and performing in and around Seattle during his one-year term is Cody Walker. Again, I want to thank all the finalists, and of course, along with the title goes $100 in hard cash. There you are. And an opportunity to end this event with one last poem. Well, well, thank you so much. I am, I'm really surprised. I, am, I thought I was going to finish third or fourth. Um, I, this, the, this is really a reflection more, I think, on the institutions and organizations that I'm associated with, the UW Department of English and the Richard Hugo House, and especially Seattle Arts and Lectures, um, and their terrific writers in the schools program. Um, but I am, um, well, I will try to do a good job, and um, <laughs> no doubt pass this on to Roberto or Angela or Richard next year, so I'll look forward to that. I'll end with a poem called, uh, you know, I was teaching at the Richard Hugo House this summer, and I, um, we, we, I was teaching high school kids, and we started um, writing a whole bunch of poems about monkeys. So, this is one. The unexpected guest. I love monkeys, but I didn't expect to see one at my door. He was wearing a flannel shirt and red high tops, and in some ways he reminded me of myself, minus the monkey part. What up, I asked, which immediately sounded dumb, but what can you do, I'd already said it. The monkey shifted uncomfortably, and in this too, he reminded me of myself. Years later, when we were both more relaxed, <laughs> I asked the monkey if he thought I would ever amount to anything, if I would fall in love, for example, or if I would just float through life, a blurred face in the middle of the crowd. But the monkey was beyond such questions. I liked to watch him in his Buddha pose, arms out, feet tucked, and a smile, such a smile that I can't describe it. I don't even want to describe it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Congratulations to Cody Walker, our new poet populist. An important reminder, a lot of the poets you saw today have chat books for sale, and you can meet them outside of this venue as soon as it's over. Say hi, buy one of their books. And of course, there will be a book signing by Judith Roche as well. Thank you and enjoy the festival.